Hi aspirants. Welcome to the weekly current affairs discussion for polity and international relation. This video will exclusively contain topics for polity. The first topic for today is the Smart Cities Mission. The Smart Cities Mission was launched on June 25, 2015. It was launched in 2015. So we are talking about this because this was in news regarding the ICCs. We will see what is that. Here within the Smart Cities Mission, we have something called as the Area Based Development, which includes city improvement or simply called as retrofitting that is making changes improving and another one is city renewable or simply called as redevelopment this is city renewal so simply completely renewing a city making like a new city and the other one is city extension so city extension which is a green field development a new city is developed so this is a city extension so these are the various types in the or the various classifications in the area based development and apart from this we have something called as a pan city initiative an initiative for the entire city in which smart solutions are applied covering larger parts of the city so within the smart cities mission we have something called as area based development in which you either make extra things for the city or you completely renew a city or you extend the city where a new part of a city is created and for all these three types in common we have something called smart solutions where new initiatives or smart ideas are applied for all these three types now the key focus areas of the smart cities mission includes something like construction of walkways pedestrian crossings cycling tracks waste management systems which are made efficient integrated traffic management systems and so on these are the important key focus areas of the smart cities mission and the scheme also assesses various indices that is ranking system to see how far the rankings have been going on how well the development is being done so that a ranking is given so that there is a healthy competition between different cities or different states and some of these indices include ease of living index municipal performance index city gdp framework climate smart cities assessment framework all these are different rankings or indexes given to promote this smart cities mission and in the smart cities mission we have something called as the icc for each city it is a vital step so this iccc are designed to enable authorities to monitor the status of various amenities in real time this i c we have exclusively covered in the earlier polity uh, sessions so you can just have a look at that so this is like a real time monitoring uh, something like a war zone something like that the next topic is tapping a phone so what are the laws that govern the tapping a phone this topic is in news because shiv sena's sanjay rao he has accused the central government of protecting the ips officer rashmi shukla under the probe for tapping the phones of political leaders in 2019 so what are the laws under this when authorities make a request to the cell phone service provider like jio or airtel or vodafone or something like that when they make a request to these service providers it is bound by the law to record the conversation on the given phone number and provide these details in real time through a connected computer so if the authorities ask the telephone companies have to provide all these details and now who can have this authority to tap the phones in the states police have the powers to tap the phones and at the center 
ten agencies are authorized to do so. So, what are those ten agencies? You have the Intelligence Bureau or IB. You have the CBI, ED or Enforcement Directorate, Narcotics Control Bureau, Central Board of Direct Taxes, Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, National Investigation Agency, RAW, Directorate of Signal Intelligence and the last one is the Delhi Police. So all these central authorities have the permission to record a conversation or simply tap a phone. So if any other authority taps a phone, it is considered to be illegal. Only these set of institutes or in the state government, state police can authorize to tap the phone in the central government or the whole list that I gave just now, this whole list of institutions can tap a phone. This is legal. Any other authority tries to tap a phone, it becomes illegal. In India, phone tapping is governed by the Telegraph Act of 1885. So, this one you have to know it is Telegraph Act of 1885. So, within this, let us get into a little bit interior details. The section 5, clause 2 of this telegraph act says, on the occurrence of any public emergency or in the interest of public safety, phone tapping can be done by the centre or the state if they are satisfied, if it is necessary in the interest of public safety or sovereignty and integrity of India. The security of the state, friendly relations with foreign countries or simply to protect the public order. So, if for any of these reasons, the authority feels it is necessary, they can tap the phone. And the last reason to tap a phone can be to prevent incitement or to prevent violence. For this reason also, they can tap a phone. So, all this is given under Section 5, Clause 2 of the Telegraph Act of 1885. But there is an exception that is for the press. For the press, there is an exception. Press message intended to be published in India of correspondence accredited to the central government or a state government shall not be intercepted or detained unless their transmission has been prohibited under this. Simply, if something is not prohibited under this 5 clause 2, press information cannot be detained, they cannot be censored, they cannot be stopped. The competent authority must record reasons for tapping in writing. Okay, for if you, if the authority, the list of authorities that we gave just now, if that authority is going to tap any phone, they have to have a written record on giving the reasons for tapping that phone. The next detail is who authorizes phone tapping. The rule 419A, rule 419A of the Indian Telegraph Amendment rules of 2007, it says that shall not be issued an order or authorization for tapping a phone shall not be issued except by an order made by the secretary to the government of India in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Simply, the Home Affairs Home Ministry Secretary, the Secretary of the Home Ministry, he has to give permission. In the case of Government of India, so if Government of India, the central government needs to tap, the Secretary to the Home Affairs have to approve it. And if it is by the state government, it has to be the Secretary of State to the Home, home Ministry of the State Government. So, in both the cases, it is the secretary to the home department of the or the home ministry who has to authorize for tapping a phone. Now, so all these are for normal situation. In case of emergency, if the home secretary is not available, let us say, but any of the listed agencies, they have to tap a phone. 
which is really necessary due to an emergency situation what can be done so in unavoidable circumstances an order to authorize for tapping a phone may be issued by an officer and that officer should not be below the rank of the joint secretary joint secretary of the government of india who has been authorized by the union home secretary or the state home secretary that is let us say it is like if the president is not there the vice president will take care of the duties similarly if the secretary to the home department is not there he can authorize the joint secretary to take care of this job that is to authorize to tap a phone in remote areas or for operational reasons if it is not feasible to get the prior directions so it is a very emergency situation we have to get the permission to tap a phone from the joint secretary or secretary but since the area is very remote it is a very remote terrain no communication facilities in that case a call can be interpreted or intercepted or tapped with the prior approval of the head or the senior second most officer of the authorized law enforcement agency at the central level and by authorized officer not below the rank of the inspector general of the police so you don't have to uh, remember so much i'm just uh, reading the exact law but since one thing you have to remember is it is simply the ig so in the case of emergency where the situation is in remote areas where it is not possible to communicate for authorization the ig can authorize for tapping the phone inspector general of the police can authorize that's it the next second topic we have to discuss today is about the anti defection law so this anti defection law is in use because mr venkaiya naidu has said it is time to amend the anti defection law he says the anti defection law is so much diluted it is almost like it has become useless so what is the only reason for making this anti defection law was to stop something called as horse trading is to stop something called as horse trading or disrupting the working government in the state or in the center but here this 10th schedule that is anti defection right has so many loopholes that it becomes utmost useless the paragraph 3 of this 10th schedule was omitted by the constitutional amendment that is in the 91st amendment this paragraph 3 was omitted and that is a mistake that is what mr venkai naidu says this amendment came to effect in the year 2004 the actual paragraph 3 it had it protected defectors as long as one third of the members of a political party formed a separate group so what is the anti defection law about if i join a party and i become an mla representing that party suddenly i move out of that party i want to switch to another party i lose my membership of the assembly that is i cannot be the mla thereafter this is simply the anti defection law even if i am a minister my minister posting also goes this is anti defection law but there was an exception in it in the paragraph 3 which said if one third of the members if one third of the members of a political party they together decide that is they are going to switch a party or they are going to form a new political party or something then there is an exception anti defection law will not be used against them but this was later on omitted in the 91st amendment so if you see in the context of small assemblies one third of the members could easily be cobbled together it's very easy to form one third of the members in a small assembly in such situation a government stability was always in the question so this was fixed only in the year 2003 in the 91st amendment so we always know we have seen even in various history classes that if a country has to be disturbed the first thing to be disturbed is political stability and in economy classes we would have discussed about you people would have read that during the third five year plan the plan was not very successful and there were even days where something were called as plan holidays 
and one important reason for this was there was no political stability in india at those times so if a country has to be disrupted if a country has to be made weak or whatever the first thing to be done is there should be political instability in the country and one of the problems in democracy is that people could be easily doing this that is if the opposition party thinks they could easily buy the mlas they could buy the mps and we we commonly see this in news right people mlas or mps are may are made to sit in a um, are in a hotel they are locked in a resort then after some time when they come out they switch parties and all such things are done and this is called as horse trading giving money and buying mlas and mps so if a government is functioning properly if that government has to be made instable if that government is to be toppled what the opposition party can easily do pay some money to the mlas or mps ask them to switch parties or ask them to resign or ask them to vote against the ruling party in the parliament maybe if they if they do this in a money bill the government can be toppled so the government is always in a jeopardy the country is always in a threat of political instability so to solve this this anti defection law was made but this paragraph 3 was a loophole in that and that loophole was removed in the year 91st amendment in the year 2003 be very clear about this details so after the omission of this paragraph 3 paragraph 4 allowed for the protection of defecting members if two third of the members of the legislative party merged with another political party so earlier it was the paragraph 3 said if one third members decided to move to another political party it's fine it's okay they can do it but in the uh, 2003 91st amendment this was quashed this paragraph 3 was removed but later we have something called as paragraph 4 so what does paragraph 4 say so if it is not one third let it be two third if two third members of a political party together decide that they are going to switch the party so it is not defection that is what the paragraph 4 says so political bias of the speakers acting as tribunals is apparent from how disqualification petitions are dealt with so this is a problem again so if it is a ruling party normally we know that the presiding officer that is the speaker in the case of lok sabha or the chairman in the case of rajya sabha they are most probably be from the political party we know this so when there is an anti defection case on a particular person it is said that the presiding officer act biased so if it is the member belonging to their party they act accordingly and if it is a member belonging to the opposition party they act accordingly why a complaint first raised regarding anti defection it will be decided by the presiding officer whether it can be considered for anti defection or not so let us say there is an opposition party and to create instability within that opposition party or stopping them from winning in any forthcoming election or something let us the ruling party plays a foul play here they buy the members they buy the mlas or mps from that opposition party but we know the presiding officer will be most probably from the ruling party and he does not take action of that opposition party member because that opposition party members actually doing something for this ruling party so here also we can see there is a problem because of this fourth paragraph so that is why there is a need to be an amend for amendment for this act so that's what is said in the news so what is paragraph 4 clause 1 it says that a member of the house will not be disqualified from his membership where his original political party merges with another political party so this is very fair right so there's nothing wrong with this one so if the whole political party the complete party merges with another party so that cannot be called that you are switching a party so that it is a defection no it cannot be called that is what is said in clause 1 of the paragraph 4 in this anti defection law so what about paragraph 4 clause 2 it says that a merger would be deemed to have taken place only if not less than 2/3 of the members of the legislative party have agreed to merge so it brings in a condition that is 2/3 so so what is the condition for a merger whether it is all the 100% if let us say there are 200 members in a party only if all the 200 members decide they can merge with another party no 
if two thirds of the members of that particular party decide we are going to merge with another party, yes, they can do it. It is not going to be called as defection. That is what paragraph four, clause two says. If two thirds of the members of the legislative party are bought over by means of fair or foul means, what can be done? So that is the question that is being going on in the news for the past one week. So let us say. There is a particular party which is, let us say, and it could be an opposition party or something, or and that party is not letting the ruling parties act to be passed. If the ruling party is very much rich enough, they have a lot of money, if they are able to buy two third members of a political party and ask them to merge with some other party or merge them, ask them to merge with their own party, so what could happen here? So, again, defection plays a rule here. So, this par uh, paragraph 4, clause 2 is also having a loophole. That is what is said in the news. So, even though the provisions of paragraph 4 are not ex facie attracted, ex facie attracted is at, uh, just like that. The Speaker of the Assembly makes sure that the proceedings are interminably prolonged so that the term of the Assembly comes to an end before the proceedings under the 10th schedule against those ex facie defectors have been concluded. Simply, it is simply such that, let us say, a person is elected for the Legislative Assembly. He is an MLA now. He has five years of tenure. On the third year of his regime, he decides to switch a party. Now, the problem is, F defection has to be applied on him. But here are the rules, like we have paragraph 4, we have paragraph 4, class 1, paragraph 4, class 2, and so many things are there. And according to this, the speaker has to decide whether what he has done is defection or not. So, what the speaker is doing here, what the presiding officers do here is, if they are biased towards any party, what they used to do is, they just keep prolonging the process. Though they know that they have to do it, they simply keep prolonging the process until when? Until the tenure of that person is over. That is, they wait for two more years. Five years, the tenure is itself over. Now, whether it, uh, it is defection or not, it's no matter at all. Five years is over for them. So, they are using this loophole. The presiding officers are using this as a loophole to, cre uh, to create a barrier for this anti-defection law itself. So, the anti-defection law is weak. So, we have to make changes. That is what they are saying. And what about Article 164, Clause 1D? It has some details about this. It says that a member of the Legislative Assembly who is disqualified from being a member of that House under paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule shall also be disqualified to be a minister from the date of his disqualification. You don't have to learn, read so much, not needed at all. You don't have to read so much. Simply, if a person is disqualified under defection, he loses his membership of the house. That is, either if he is an MLA, he ceases to be an MLA. If he is an MP, he ceases to be an MP. Not just that, if he is holding any ministry, he will lose his minister post also. That's all. He will lose his minister post also. That's it. That's the only thing which is said in this Article 164, Clause 1B. Now, this allows for the toppling of the government by inducements of various kinds. So, we know, right? So, remo uh, so what is the government? The government can be simply said the Prime Minister from the, uh, and the Council of Ministers. In the case of states, the Chief Minister from and the Council of States. So, this allows for the toppling of government for in by inducement of various kinds. The motivation is that a fresh election allows the disqualified member to be re-elected. He then becomes a member of the Assembly once again as it is the term is not over and can also be appointed as a minister. So, under article 164 clause 1b, such a defection has no real consequence at all. So, that is what it says. So, what is the point in having this article 164 clause 1b? So, simply they lose their uh, position as a minister. Okay, that is fine. Now, they will go and again contest in the election because that place is vacant there, maybe uh, by uh, another party, let us uh, say a person X, a person X belongs to party A. So, he belongs to party A, X is here now. Now, he wants to switch to party B. 
maybe he uh, there was horse trading he received lot of money and he wants to move to party b and he moves and so because of defection he loses his membership he is no more an mla now then and moreover he was a minister now he loses his minister post also now what is going to do that's all that's it over he'll go and contest in the same election in another party b if he wins the election again he'll come, uh, come back to the same party as an mla and again he'll be given the minister post so what happens is people don't fear anything for this defection at all okay i'll i'll just defect and what's going to happen nothing i'll again become an mla and again i again become a minister and in between this process i got lot of money so this is a way provoking corruption in politics so if corruption in policy uh, politics have to be checked properly this anti defection law has to be very strict that is what this amendment is about so this one very few questions can be asked in the prelims one thing what you have to know is you have to be you have to take your polity book and learn everything about the anti defection law but these details you can use it in your gs2 paper so all that we discussed now is a very good content for your gs2 paper now the next question is what can be done now so this is the problem so what is the solution what is the way forward now the speakers when elected must resign from the party to which they belong that is one thing maybe that can be done and at the at the end of their term there should be a cooling off period that is after they resign as the speaker they cannot immediately go back and join the political party there should be some time also so the speaker should resign from the party if once they become the speaker they should resign from their party this is one thing and second one is paragraph 4 of this 10th schedule should be omitted by moving a constitution amendment they say already this uh, paragraph 3 was removed now just remove this paragraph 4 also it is too much lenient and the third one is all those disqualified under paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule should neither be entitled to, to contest elections nor hold public office for 5 years so you do defection you are disqualified you again go contest an election come back as a mla or the comeback as a mp so they, they don't fear defection at all so once you are punished under uh, defection law once you are punished under this anti defection you cannot contest an election you cannot hold any other public office for the next 5 years such an amendment should be made that is what they are recommending until now it's not there they are recommending such an amendment should be made now article 164 clause 1b should be omitted that is another one so 164 class 1b also should be removed by an amendment and all petitions for disqualification of members under the paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule should be decided by adopting a summary procedure within a period of 3 months simply they are saying that there should be a time given there should give be a time given to the speaker that is 3 months so we saw that right so if there is a defection uh, case against a person and he has two more year to finish his complete tenure what the speaker does is he keeps on prolonging this procedure for two more years he completely finishes his five years of tenure and this whole anti defection it becomes a funny game nothing so if a defection case is pointed as a person the speaker has to make a decision within 3 months this should be made as an amendment so this is a another way forward solution and an appeal should be provided for under the 10th schedule only to the supreme court so if a verdict is given by the speaker if a decision is taken in the uh, assembly that a person is defected or not defected or whatever if they have to appeal the only solution should be the supreme court and there should not be any other appeal at all so simply in one word what they are asking to do is make the anti defection law a strong one it is now a weak act make it a strong one some of the suggestions are remove clause 4 sorry remove uh, paragraph 4 of the 10th schedule remove article 164 clause 1d give time limit for the speaker to decide if a person is convicted for defection he should not contest an election he should not hold any public office for the next 5 years so strong the anti defection law has to be made 
the anti defection law that we have now is as good as not having a law that is what the newspaper was talking in the last one week okay. and that's it for today's class please revise the conventional topics here that is the anti defection part that is the tense period in your conventional book jai hind thank you if you found the content good please share it with your friends let's learn and grow together